the scorching summer days in the month of April, May and June, the year 1757, the palace of Jagat Seth at Mahimapur, not too far from the royal palace of Bengal's Nawab Siraj ud is being frequented by the shadowy figures of Bengal politics. A plan, a conspiracy of immense treachery is being hatched. A conspiracy that will culminate in the mango groves of Plassey when the army led by Mirzafar will not take part in the battle and East India Company defeating the Nawab's army will change the history of India forever. Almost the entire Bengal aristocracy participated in the conspiracy. There was Mirzafar, Mansabdar, Minister and Cavalry Chief, Rai Durlab, the Hindu Mansabdar and the Chief of the Cavalry can be seen. Yar Lutuf Khan, the Chief of Siraj's Army, Ghasiti Begum, daughter of the previous Nawab Ali Vaddi Khan, Raja Raj Ballav, waiting for his chances, also joined. Maharaja Krishna Chandra, the Hindu Zamindar of Krishnanagar, took part in the conspiracy. Maniklal, a Mansabdar, helped the conspirators. And finally, there were Jagat Seth Mahataprai of Mahimapur, who helped the conspiracy with intelligence and wealth. Jagat Singh Mahatap Rai and Maharaj Sharuk Chand were arguably the wealthiest men not just in Bengal but in the entire country as well. They were the bankers to the rich and the famous for generations, the zamindars and the nawabs of Bengal. But more than that, they controlled the economy of virtually half of the country. The big question is, why did then Jagat Singh resort to such a bloody ritual of treachery? Why did such a powerful businessman, identified by Thomas Macaulay and John Stuart Mill as the wealthiest banker in the country, demean himself to the role of a conspirator? Is it the only truth about Jagat Seth? <laughs> the answer is a complex one, buried in the murky history of the past. And to reveal it, we will have to go back in time, perhaps a few centuries back. The homeland of these people was dusty desert lands of Rajputana. There, the rainfall was scanty. Agriculture and animal husbandry could not provide people with enough earnings. Occasional famine was a part of hard lives of these people. Trading was the only opportunity to earn a decent living. Shekhawati, or one portion of Rajasthan, That is the place where all trade routes were passing. Goods were coming from Afghanistan, China, and they have to be transported up to Gujarat, Western Ghats of India. After the rule of Akbar or even Jahangir, there was almost all anarchy. Marathas 
they have made a life hell in Rajasthan. The barbaric attack of the Marathas made the situation even worse. The result was a steady stream of Marwari exodus throughout history. The earliest link of Marwaris with Bengal can be traced back to the year 1564 when Rajput soldiers under Akbar's flag came to camp out there under the reign of Suleiman Kirani. The contract of supplying essentials was awarded to the merchants of Marwar. Upon their arrival in Bengal, they introduced themselves as Marwaris. But since they also wore pagris or turbans, they were also known as Pagridhari Marwaris. First time, I think, with Todramal, some people from Rajasthan came here and then they stayed, Todramal went back. And then came Manshing. With the Manshing, people came in his force. Naturally, the people from Rajasthan were there. Some of them stayed here. Even your Purviman Bhum, Singh Bhum, they are all shows that Manshing had a very important role in this part of India, like that. The journey was difficult, often made in foot or in camel-drawn caravans followed by journey in cargo boats. But the natural instinct for business and money made the Marwari people withstand the hardship of such journeys. One of them, after that period, stayed here, Hiranand Shah. He was in Patna. He was very efficient financial manager. And then they you know, House of Jagat Sikh. This family would later on come to be known as the great Jagat Sikhs of Bengal, the betrayers who sold the country to the East India Company Limited. Our story begins in the year 1652. It's a sunny day in April. Hiranand Shao, a merchant, reaches Patna from Nagore, a relatively prosperous town of Marwar in Rajasthan. His final destination, Bengal. Patna in those days was an important center of business and administration as six railroads, that is Bad Shahi Sadak, as well as river transport were fully used by the businessmen from this country as well as from others. Hiranan Sao the Jain trader of Svetambar clan raised such an atmosphere of thriving business with an addiction of business as his only capital. Hiranand very quickly established himself as an important merchant and started seven trading houses at seven different locations of India including Dhaka, Patna and Delhi. As time went on, there was a steady rise in the fortune of the family of Hiranand Sao. His eldest son, Manikchand, became close to Mushid Kuli Khan, whom he supported with his wealth during political crisis. He also transferred the core of his business to Muksudabad, later to be known as Mushidabad. There was brisk business as foreign businessmen from Britain, Armenia, Holland, Belgium, France and many other countries came to Bengal. The export economy was heavily funded by Fateh Chand. Fateh Chand was conferred the title of Jagat Shet, the banker of the world in 1724 by the Mughal emperor of the time. The circumstances under which this was earned is very, very interesting. In 1722, there was a countrywide scarcity of currencies. It was not a famine in right sense of the term, but there were plenty of food and goods to be bought in the market. But lacking of silver and silver coins led to an artificial famine in which thousands of people, even in the capital Delhi, were on the verge of death. 
in such a situation Fateh Chand in agreement with the emperor distributed hundi from his daily trading house those hundis were to be treated equal to the silver currency the crisis was overcome and the states of Mahimapur established even more firmly their control over Delhi and Bengal. After Mushid Kuli came Sujauddin, Sarfraj and Aliverdi to the throne of Bengal. But the economy was controlled by states of Mahimapur. In the later years, there was ferocious attack of the Burgis of Maharashtra and also the tortures of the Afghan mercenaries. The Borghese carried away three to four crore Arkan coins with them as part of their bounty. This comes to between 30 and 40 billion rupees by today's estimation. But even apparently this great loss did not deter the great Seth from conducting with business as usual. When Siraj Uddola became the Nawab of Bengal, Mahatabrai was Jagat Set and his brother Swarupchand was called Maharaj. The young Nawab demanded three crores of rupees from Jagat Set as expenditure of the warfare. It was impossible even for the bankers of the Nawab. The agriculture and cottage industry based economy of Bengal has suffered serious setback in the last few decades. The angry Nawab slapped Jagat Set in his court. The slapping might be a story, but the perpetual fear of Jagat Seth for their wealth was too real. He wanted to get rid of the fear. Almost the entire Bengal aristocracy sided with Jagat Seth, and a conspiracy was hatched. The chance defeat of Siraj at the hands of the British in a chaotic foggy morning encouraged the conspirators even more. They started to believe that Siraj can be overthrown with the help of East India Company. Most of the meetings took place at Jagat Seth's house. Even the division of wealth that was to take place after Siraj's defeat was calculated in his presence. On 23rd June 1757, near a mango grove at Palasi, Siraj Uddala lost the battle and had to escape. The Battle of Kasi is one of the most significant happenings that affected the course of Indian history. In that battle, there were actually only 516 soldiers lost. Now, the British company controlled the politics and economy of Bengal. They started their own mint at Calcutta. Jagat Seth could do nothing about it. The Seths watched as their grip over Bengal was sleeping away quickly. It was completed when Mir Qasim came to power. Jagat Seth was taken to Munger by the river Bhagirathi. No trace of Jagat Seth Mahatabrai and Maharaj Swarup Chand was found. They were probably thrown from the Munger castle or were turned into pieces in Patna by the order of Mir Qasim. And what happened after that? As one poet observed, the rest is silence. The original home of Jagat Seth, <laughs> I'm probably sitting right on top of it. The fact is, the original palace of Jagat Seth got washed away by the river Ganges some 200 years ago and probably lies submerged down there. After the fall of the house of Jagat Seth, there is a great deal of rise in the commercial activity of the Marwari community in and around Calcutta. Now who encouraged them? Who gave them the impetus to get rich as traders? The answer might surprise us all. The British East India Company, the same company that wiped the first Marwari house from Bengal. That's right. In the years between 
1756 to 1803, during the establishment of British power, there was great rise in the migration of Marwaris from Rajputana to Bihar and Bengal. As railway lines spread far and wide in the hinterlands of the country, the rate of migration of Marwari traders accelerated in the years between 1860 to 1900. Calcutta, being the center of British rule in India, offered more opportunities. The ever-increasing importance of Calcutta port and export of jute along with the political importance of Calcutta as capital of British India made the Marwaris flock to the city. A classic example of Marwari businessmen migrating to and settling at Calcutta and other eastern cities at this time almost always followed the following track. First, the trader Generally, a young adult reaches Calcutta by train, leaving behind his family at some remote place of Shekhawati or some other region of Rajputana. They come as the only men folk do come here. They do not have their houses here. They used to sleep in Gaddis. And see, two factors are very important this Gaddi and Basa system. He gets shelter at the basa of some other Marwari businessman already settled at the city. He then moves around the gaddis of other traders in search of opportunities. Here the close affinity between the members of Marwari community plays a very important role. They always provided the family members and relatives with support, opportunities and at times with capital. The young businessman generally begins his trading in cotton, opium and jute. He might also begin his career as a shopkeeper or a small-scale moneylender as well as trader popularly known as sahukars. Some worked as the shroffs, indigenous style bankers. As he grows familiar with the tricks of business, in the areas he thrives to be a bunion of the foreign trading companies, more specifically of some British firms. As he grows in confidence and wealth, he calls other male members of the family to look after the business. As late as 1921, the Marwaris of Calcutta numbered less than 15,000. But in first two decades of 20th century, when railway connected Calcutta with Shekhawati region of Rajasthan, women and the families were brought to Calcutta. And after that, there was a general change in the nature of Marwari migration itself. As the number of Marwaris increased in Bengal, they slowly started to take hold of the almost all business areas of the land. But one important question needs to be addressed here. How could the Marwaris outshine their counterparts from Bengal in their own homeland? The answer probably lies in the cultural attitude of the two communities. Entrepreneurship cannot be imported, cannot be exported in our language chakki pichna then dahi bilona aur is dakki aur dahi ke sath rajasthani folk songs gaye jate the ki janni jane to do jan ke data ke sur nai to reh je banjri mata gawaje noor lady se kehte hain ki if if you want to give birth to any child, the child should be either a data, donor or a sur, a brave man. Ye dono nahi hota hai, don't give a birth, don't lose your body. 
So this type of inspirations were there in our that people from that part. So they were did like that. That is one of the factor for that. And for middlemen and the Raleigh Ben in your right. Like in those who were in the trade, why they became success, Uske Piche, I am of the opinion ki risk taking. That is a very special quality of Marwari community. The important commodities in which the Marwaris of Calcutta dealt during this period were opium, jute, tea and coal. However, jute soon got identified as Marwari trade, which was originally a Bengali occupation. In 1917, the Birla brothers established the first Indian office for the export of jute in London and rapidly became one of the three leading jute exporters. Some of these Marwari traders soon started their own jute mills. During the World War I, the control over the key speculative markets over the cotton cloth import and jute and Haitian trade provided war profits which enabled some Marwaris in manufacturing and industrialization. The spectacular rise of the Marwaris on the economic front during the pre-independence years has often been tainted by accusations of greed, malpractices and corruption. Some of it is undeniably true and has left a permanent scar on the identity of the community. The blame for the December 1917 cloth riots in Bara Bazaar was placed on the rapidly rising prices of dhotis and taris. The unnatural price rise was due to a speculation known as cornering done by the Marwaris. The practice of speculation and gambling was an inseparable part of Marwari traders in those years. These were commonly known as Barsat ke Satta, Aphin ka Satta or Kapas ka Satta. One of the earliest of such practices was rain gambling in which people used to gamble on the probability of rainfall on different times of the day. See, at the time of war from 1910 to 1920 there was big rise and fall in the shares and at that time the concept of stock exchange has also come. I do not have any reservation to accept it that few houses minted lot of money in that forward trading. As you know, people of segment of the community was indulging into this ghee thing or you know the holding of clothes and but at the same time there were lots of others you know who were trying to change all this you know about the stigma which was uh, caused uh, by, by such incidents. Definitely there have there have been a lot of efforts you know to overcome that because as the freedom for independence was going on, you know, and Gandhiji's influence was there. And lots of social reforms within the community were also taking place. Marwari community was split into two people, the conservatives, the Sanatanis, as they, as they were called, and then the Sudharaks, you know, I mean, who wanted to change all this. I mean, they were quite ashamed of, uh, you know, the, I mean, the stigma that was the Mero Khoto, you know, that kind of thing, you know, that was, uh, and their, uh, conception as, as money-minded people who were culturally very inferior. Actually on the streets like you know they were uh, protesting against you know this uh, Parda Pratha and you know the child marriage thing and uh, the dowry system you know they were and they, there was this question of widow remarriage in 1926 the first widow remarriage took place. So you see that lots of changes were going on to and as uh, Ashok Seksarya you know uh, who is kind of a guru to me and whose father was a freedom fighter. 
like Ashoji uh, used to say, you know, that when we were growing up, we used to think that once India becomes independent, you know, we won't be called Medo and Khoto. You know, I mean, that kind of, that pain, you know, and that sense of infer inferiority complex was very much there. So I think there was a lot of introspection and a lot of uh, turmoil and a lot of uh, even, you know, this urge, you know, to do some kind of movement, you know, to change all this. People generally believe, and of course with some justification, that Marwaris were against Indian freedom struggle. But we will be surprised to know that there were instances where Marwaris participated in armed rebel against the British rule. In Bengal, you see, arms were banned, but in Rajasthan, arms were not banned. Their typewriter was banned because these Raja and Rajwada were afraid of education. They were not afraid of Bandhuk. So, Sachindir Sanyal and Rasbari Bose, even they were supplied arms from Rajasthan through this media. There was one Vijay Singh Pathik who was hands in club with these people like that. Be it in the 50s and early 60s, which was a golden period of Indian capital, or the 80s, considered to be the time of license Raj, the Marwari companies and firms continued to rule over the economy of Bengal. The later generations of Sir Hariram and his son Badridas are today the very successful RPG group. The Birlas, the largest group of Marwari speculators to emerge after the World War I, are still among the largest of industrial groups. There are also newer Marwari houses which have done great business. The ways of business have certainly changed. Gone are the days of the Pildi Bada Bazar Gaddi and the use of all amazing code language that is Murya script which is entirely their own. Marwari's businessmen now that script is just nobody can read that but that was a very popular script Murya and now we people are doing on the computer but Todorman has designed some formulas of business script may it is just like stenographer is may matra in a yoti to parne me aap likte kuch hai or parne wala kuch hi par chakta hai udhan ke liye joke dete hai ki sab baba ji aj mere gaye to ay jay mere bas itna hi likhe is may upar matra nahi rahe to parne wala jo aap ki lipi ko par chakta hai script ko wo to samaj jayega कि आपने लिखा है लेकिन कोई नया आदमी पढ़ सकता है तो ये भी पढ़ सकता है बाबा जी ऐ जय को आज पढ़ सकता है मैं रह को मर गए पढ़ सकता है आज आज बाबा जी आज मर गए और यदि ये पढ़ लिया गया तो उसके घर में तो सारा मातम हो जाएगा उसका रिशिप नहीं हो सकता है इट हैपन समथिंग लाइक और इट इज हैपन समाइम नाउ न्यू कॉर्पोरेट ऑफिस आर द सेंटर ऑफ एक्टिविटीज the birther system of maintaining the daily account certainly have paved way for more sophisticated modes of accounting. The generally intuitive approach of the early days has been replaced by a more systematic management culture. The change is also reflected in the types of residences in which the Marwaris began to dwell in. But there have been major qualitative changes affecting the social life of the Marwaris in the last few decades. But this time, it is the migration of a different kind, from the dingy gandhis of Bada Bazaar, Finish Park and Central Avenue, to the much more fashionable expanses of Baligans, Park Street, Salt Lake and Adipur. The houses at Bada Bazaar were modeled to some extent on the homes at Shekhavati region. Keeping in mind the necessity of business, they used to have two or even more courtyards. The focus was on utility. 
but the newer residences are palatial and to some extent are indices to the social changes through which the Marwari community has gone. With the second wave of migration, we can say that there was certainly a parallel opening up of the traditionally conservative nature of the Marwari society. As members of the community spread over to the eastern and southern parts of the city, there was certainly a visible change, societal change within the community. The question of women's education and occupation, dowry, etc. is now faced with more progressiveness. There have been more emphasis on women's education and occupation in these last few decades. I think that uh, whatever has been the struggle of Marwadi women, you know, over the generations, over the last generations, but I think that has earned if not our generation, then definitely our daughter's generation. They wanted to change things. And there were lots of reforms, you know, the movements, small, small movements that were going on for women's education also. Like Marwadi Walika Vidyalaya was set up in 1920. <laughs> Shitaram ji saksariya and Ghanushyam ji bildu. Matro dujun bacha ni, dujun me ni, e school shuru hoi chulo. Tar pade e dujun thheke akon bharte bharte, mano odhe chahidha ato bere ga chakon shikha potishthan gulo te mano shikha javaar juno, egi javaar juno odhe chahidha ato hoi ga chhe, jor akon amra mota moti nasari thheke, 11 12 porjonto 1000 student pay a big journalist like tarun tejpal uh, when he met me in delhi for this uh, british council women's writing program and he, he was very surprised to see me and he said that well where have you sprung from you know like calcutta marwaris are usually thought to be a conservative ones i can say ki there is no census but if census is done in calcutta it is 100% literacy, girls' education should be not less than 99%. So it is a big change. And so I think that I am waiting for the day, you know, when people will now stop being surprised, you know, that any uh, Marwadi girl or woman um, uh, makes a place of her own under the sun in any of the professions. Gradually, the next generation, in spite of natural inclination towards their traditional values, began to feel the need to educate themselves, and the result, hopefully, no doubt, a step on the threshold of a new arena. It is the coexistence of such contradictory qualities as being loyal to one's tradition and the desire to venture out in search of new opportunities that led the Marwaris to migrate from one success to another. Many years ago, Jagat had set such an example of success, isolated you might say. But the Marwaris of present-day Bengal have it within them to carry this legacy forward. And this legacy does not seem to ever sink into the abyss of oblivion.